Um, we're going to spend the rest of the morning talking about the buildings themselves with focus on the building uh, systems and Andy Persley is going to be our coordinator and I am without further ado turning it over to Andy. Thank you, Thank you Joan and, and as they say you know now for something almost completely different right. Um, like Brent, I am also not a biologist, and I found a lot of yesterday's discussion very interesting and very confusing. So I, we have three speakers who are going to return the favor. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me do that. The goals of this session are to talk about three key building systems, HVAC, that Dennis Stanky is going to talk about after I wrap up. The building envelope, you know, what separates the building, the indoors from the outdoors, that's no, none other than Terry Brennan. And last but not least, interior surfaces, Jeff Siegel. There are other building systems that are really important, and I'm going to mention those in, in a minute. So we're going to talk about what, what are these building systems to hopefully give you a little context. Talk about the system features that are likely to have an impact on the indoor microbiome. And then finally, you know, um, known links between these features and the indoor microbiome. At least that's what I asked Dennis, Terry, and Jeff to talk about. We'll, we'll see what they actually have in mind. This slide is just to kind of make the point that there's a whole range of buildings out there. Each one of these has a story that I don't have time for or you don't have time for. And then there's all sorts of systems on the right, ventilation systems. I will make the point that an open window is a natural ventilation system, but that schematic diagram with the stack, that's like a designed, engineered natural ventilation system that may actually have a chance of providing the amount of air where you want it at the rates that you want, but, but no guarantees. Um, there's 100 million dwellings in the United States and about five or six million commercial institutional buildings. The range of age and size and construction and heating and cooling systems and all those other parameters have a big impact on the things that we all care about. Uh, you know, maybe we'll have time to, to explore that. Well, we're going to explore some of that variation today, um, assuming Dennis, Terry, and Jeff uh, follow instructions. So building systems, what are the building systems that we care about? At some level, some of my colleagues who, who think about indoor air look at buildings as just a box, a nondescript box, which, you know, really bugs me. But that's one way to look at them. So there are HVAC systems that Dennis is going to talk about, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. They heat and cool buildings. They humidify and dehumidify, maybe. Um, some of them have filters to remove particles from the outdoor air that comes in or the air that's recirculated, exhaust ventilation to remove moisture and odors from bathrooms, for example, and air distribution systems. So that's a little funny image of an air handler. As soon as I pick a picture, I'm biasing the discussion because there's all these different types of HVAC systems. And as soon as you pick one, you, you've, you haven't gone down a rabbit hole, but you've gone down a hole and you've limited no natural ventilation depicted there, no, you know, all the host of other systems. But Dennis is going to talk about those. And then there's the building envelope or enclosure, as some people like to describe it. That's what Terry's going to talk about. Um, it's there to keep precipitation out, um, other weather, other things. And I never really thought about it until a tree fell on our house, but roofs keep falling objects out of the living space. That's, uh, I don't know if that's relevant to today's discussion. The fact that we have this boundary and it is insulated, you know, makes it a lot easier to keep the indoor more comfortable than outdoors. Also allows us to keep the indoor less comfortable, but uh, we, we don't try to do that on purpose. And then finally, the interior surfaces that Jeff's going to talk about. The walls separate in, in different building spaces. I want to make the point that the air sees all of these surfaces. We may not see them, but the air 
is going to go where the pressures tell it to go. So that's a point I'll come up again. There are other systems in the building that we're not going to focus a lot on today as if I know what they're going to talk about. The occupants, you know, what do they do and when and where do they do it? Plumbing systems that bring liquids, bring water into the building and remove li liquids and other wastes. Uh, food storage and isolation, uh, food storage and cooking, and then the outdoor environment. You can kind of think of a system in terms of what's the weather and what are the contaminants outside. So we're going to hear first about HVAC systems from Dennis, building envelope from Terry Brennan, and then Jeff Siegel on interior surfaces. So a few other points since I'm up here, and things I didn't have, you know, questions got cut off yesterday, so here I am. Hopefully I won't screw up the schedule too badly. One thing to note, and we're not going to get into it much today, but we, I think we need to get it into at some point, are the roles of building codes, standards, and guidelines. They're out there. They have a big influence on how buildings are designed. There are standards and codes that dictate the amount of outdoor air you need to bring into a building, the level of filtration efficiency, envelope construction for energy efficiency, and, and so on. So there's a lot out there. There's also a lot going on in, in terms of green buildings, ratings, and guidelines. Vivian's going to make a point in a, in a minute. I'm going to make a point now, which may or may not contradict what Vivian's about to say. Um, there are things that you might do in a green building that could make things worse. Um, but, you know, green buildings don't have a... Uh, um, that's not the only way you can screw up a building, you know. <laughs> Bringing in hot, humid, a lot of hot, humid air in a building that is not designed to handle a lot of hot, humid air is going to cause problems, green or not. So, um, you know, some of the issues that are raised in the context of green buildings as negatives are not exclusive to, to green buildings. So that's a little point that I'm going to throw out there, and Vivian will throw out some others. Um, ventilation, that's kind of something I, I, I've done a lot of work in. This came up yesterday, came to my head yesterday when Brent was talking, the whole issue of mechanical ventilation, natural ventilation, and infiltration. Um, buildings with mechanical ventilation may have a, a known and controlled amount of outdoor air intake, and they may have filtration that is able to remove from the air some of the stuff we care about. I wouldn't bet on either of those happening, but, but they stand that, you know, there's a possibility that you have controlled outdoor air entry and filtration. Natural ventilation, I don't know if the rates are higher, lower, or the same as a mechanically ventilated buildings, building. I have never seen a measurement of a ventilation rate in the naturally ventilated buildings that I've been comfortable with. And, I, you know, I'm behind in my reading, so I may have missed something, but it's really, really hard to... It's hard to do in a mechanically ventilated building. It's really hard to do in a naturally ventilated building. And then finally, infiltration. That's the air that enters through leaks in, in the envelope that Terry's going to talk about. Buildings tend to be leaky, you know, unless it's very specialized or somebody actually makes an, a serious effort and knows what they're doing. My, my experience to the first order, the amount of air entering a building through infiltration is the same order of magnitude as the amount of air brought in through the ventilation system, okay? And there's, there's data to back it up. We can talk about ventilation more another day. Ventilation rates vary and uh, uh, tremendously based on weather, building operation, and other factors. Related to ventilation, design intent is not necessarily realized in practice. We have standards that tell us what to do. It doesn't mean we did it. If the design are compliant with the standards, it doesn't mean it was built in compliance with the design. And if you wait long enough, all buildings will go out of tune. And, and so the actual performance of the building, we can't make the assumption um, that it's consistent with the design intent. Uh, yesterday and at the meeting in April, we talked about the EPA-based study, 100 randomly selected buildings studied in the mid-90s. Uh, I looked at the ventilation data 
that about half of the ventilation measurements were below the design value. I think even more interesting that in half of the buildings, nobody could find a record of the design ventilation rate. And that is not unusual at all, um, but it, and it's not very reassuring. Uh, my last point is that there are important spaces in buildings that are sometimes unoccupied, unobvious, that can be really important. The one on the left is a crawl space. You know, when, when we characterize a building, are we measuring what's going on in the crawl space or even thinking about it? The one in the middle is a plumbing chase across the hall from my office. Four stories tall, dirty pipes that may leak. Nobody's going to know what's going on in that space unless there's a water leak that hits the first floor. And that space has been there for 50 years, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of ugly. And then the last the picture on the right is a family of raccoons taken um, that were living on the ceiling of my uh, uh, basement bathroom. Picture taken from the attic. Um, you know, critters, as crit Kerry likes to say, critters live in buildings, not just two-legged critters, but all sorts of critters. Got rid of them by hanging up uh, rags soaked with male urine. They, they left. I don't know what's worse, the raccoons or the male urine. <laughs> well, um, I'll remember that. <laughs> So those are the, the, some of the little points I wanted to make. And Vivian wanted to talk about green buildings. I don't know what's so funny about green buildings, but. Uh. Okay, just uh, very quickly, uh, I we've circulated. I think have we circulated by email? Um, I don't think we have yet. Okay. Uh, all right, so just, uh, just so uh, the group here is aware of what uh, the building design community, the green, green building design community is up to relative, that might have a, a significant impact, positive or negative, on microbiomes. Um, LEED, which is about 10% of the building stock and is slowly being moved from a voluntary standard into some of the uh, national standards, th thanks to people like Andy and Hal, um, we're seeing them in ASHRAE standards and others, is um, pushing uh, for very different approaches to ventilation, uh, increasing minimum uh, outdoor air delivery, making sure it's being monitored, appropriately filtered. They're looking very seriously at everything inside the built environment that is emitting uh, toxins, which may or may not be good for microbiomes because some of those toxins may be killing microbiomes and we may eliminate, <coughs> eliminate the natural enemy of, of the microbiome if, if we needed an enemy. Um, they are definitely fighting for commissioning of buildings, meaning that you don't get to walk away when you finish construction. You actually have to spend some time to make sure it operates the way uh, you planned, and even continuous commissioning, which uh, you could sign on the dotted line that you will every, uh, on a periodic cycle, have people back in to check the filters and the air streams. And so there's a lot of movement to try to get at the air side of the equation. There is some um, movement uh, to try to get at better surfaces through green cleaning, uh, through uh, the selection of materials that are, are easier to keep clean. Uh, in some cases, the elimination of carpet or certain kinds of sinks. So there's some s interesting standards uh, in, in both LEED. And then the Green Guide for Healthcare is very focused on hospital uh, standards. Uh, and then there's also uh, LEED for schools as well as CHIPS for schools. So. There, uh, for the, some of the primary building types, and there are also home standards that are beginning to do this. The most recent standard, just so you know, and I've, what I've done is listed the credit titles that I think are relevant to the microbiome. So when we circulate this, just to remind you that this, there's a lot of discussion among architects and engineers and, and um, constructors of buildings. In the well standard, which is uh, uh, the newest standard that is beginning to emerge as a major player in uh, the design community, it's uh, a lot of architects around the country have begun to pursue um, well standard, uh, uh, both uh, accreditation as professionals and certification for their buildings. Uh, goes much further. I mean, it begins, it actually has a, a credit called microbe and mold control. So they actually use the word microbe in the standard. They have another credit that's anti antimicrobial activity for surfaces. So they're basically recommending the use of antimicrobial 
which may or may not be the right thing to do, but that uh, they literally are talking about microbials in the well standard. Um, they're very interested in pest management, uh, indoor air quality monitoring and, and maintenance. Um, and there also is a number of credits re related to water quality on the assumption that water is a major contributor to to failures in, in, uh, in microorganisms and, and the failures in human health. So they're looking at inorganic and organic contaminants um, and then ways in which uh, water quality is being tested um, and treated. Um, so uh, I, ju I just want you, everyone, to be aware uh, that there is a crossover that this committee needs to address, which is what are the emerging voluntary standards at this point that are trying to do the right thing and may, in fact, be making good moves or bad moves, and we need to maybe look at them. Thanks, Vivian. Um, give unlike weed, although there's been a lot of discussion in the Green Building Council about verifying performance, but as Andy pointed out, and, and I think your first bullet point, Andy, I would have added that these are for design. The, the, the standards and guidelines are for design. They apply, in theory, in permit issuing jurisdictions to getting permission to build the building, but there isn't verification either under the code or under LEED of performance according to the design, and I think your study showed that well. But the well standard is specifically about creating healthy buildings. This is a great time for me to announce that we're going to have save all the questions until after the speakers, unless somebody literally has smoke coming out of their ears. And I will be the judge of, of whether that's uh, real smoke or not. Um, so with that, uh, it's a great honor to introduce Dennis Stanky, who I've known longer than probably either of us would be able to remember. Um, I'm not going to go through a long introduction as much as I'd like to. When I talked to Dennis last week to kind of set him up for this, I said, you know, you've got to keep it somewhat simple, you know, and, and don't go into too many details. And then yesterday, when I think both of us were feeling a little lost during the talk, I, I leaned over and said, show him a damn psych chart. You know, which is only funny to some people in this room. So uh, if you think that's funny, good for you. Bennett. 